Hello again, uh, my friends. Uh, this is the fourth and final volume of the correspondence of Sir Ernest Sato, British Minister in Japan, 1895 to 1900, uh, which I want to introduce to you today. Um, okay, so this is the hardcover. It's not as thick as two or three of the other volumes, I suppose. Um, but it's, uh, it's letters from consular staff in Taiwan, or Formosa, as it was called in those days, uh, 1895 to 1900. Edited by me with a forward again by Dr. J. E. Hoare. Um, and first published uh, via lulu.com in 2014 by me. Uh, republished via Amazon Kindle Direct Publishing, that's KDP, in January 2020 as a Kindle book and a paperback, and published as a hard cover via Amazon in May 2021. Okay, so um, this is the latest, this hardcover, the latest uh, iteration. Um, so we've got contents, preface forward. Um, as usual, the Sato Papers reference is PRO 30 slash 33. And then after that, in this case, 511, 512, and 513, which are all uh, Formosa or Taiwan files. Um, and then there's a bibliography, a uh, list of my publications relating to Sato, and some internet links. Um, I don't think I'm going to read the preface because I've read that uh, before, um, at least almost, it's almost identical to the previous ones. So it's not really worth reading again if you've seen the previous videos. Um, what I can do, I suppose, is read what it says on the back cover. Um, this is the fourth and final volume in the Japan series of correspondence from the Sato Papers, PRO 30 slash 33 held at the National Archives of the United Kingdom. The series comprises letters addressed mainly to Sir Ernest Sato from the Tokyo legation and British consulates in Japan while he was minister 1895 to 1900. There are letters from other sources as well. Um, so volume one is letters from the Foreign Office, Office of Works, Tokyo legation staff, consular staff at Hakodate, Kobe and Nagasaki. Volume two, Letters from Yokohama, consular staff, the judges of Her Majesty's Court and the Chamber of Commerce. Volume three, uh, letters from British diplomatic representatives elsewhere, colonial and India authorities, naval authorities, Japanese authorities, foreign representatives, uh, by which is meant diplomatic colleagues in Tokyo and miscellaneous correspondence. Um, okay, so uh, volume four, this volume, is letters from consular staff in Formosa or Taiwan, uh, almost entirely from the Japan consular service since jurisdiction passed from the China consular service after the Sino-Japanese War of 1894 to 95. Okay, so now I'm going to, actually, um, I think I can share the... Uh, the Amazon, this is the Amazon Japan page uh, with the paperback, okay? So they will have the Kindle hardcover and paperback. Um, and what I've just done is read the, uh, read from the hardcover directly, but um, I think to, I shall read uh, Dr. Hawes uh, forward from here. Uh, so this is actually what you this is what you would see if you bought, if you purchased the or if you opened the paperback or hardcover. Um, and here is the forward, and I'm going to make this a bit larger as before, so that it's more easy to 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 see it. Um, all right, so forward, and I'm actually going to read it from here. Uh, forward, this is the final volume of Sato's semi-official correspondence from his time as minister in Japan, consisting entirely of correspondence relating to Taiwan, then generally called Formosa in the West. It is also the shortest of the four. In both the China and the Japan consular services, there was much speculation, sometimes reflected here, 
on what their future would be after the island was transferred to Japan under the terms of the Treaty of Shimonoseki, signed in April 1895, April 17th, I believe, I believe it was, um, which ended the Sino-Japanese War of 1894 to 95. And by the way, Shimonoseki is very close to where I live here in Kitakyushu. Um, the Japan service, at least in theory, hoped that the posts in Taiwan would be transferred to Japanese speaking officers, a move that would help with the promotion blockage that had begun to emerge among them. The Chinese service hoped to keep the posts. With the change from a Chinese to a Japanese administration, however, it was quickly apparent that Japanese speaking officers would be essential. Taiwan therefore was incorporated into the Japanese consular service where it would remain until 1942. When the Chinese government took over the island again after the, after the defeat of Japan in 1945, consular duties in turn reverted back to Chinese speaking officers. The British diplomatic and the various consular services were formally united in 1943. After a brief hiatus following the Chinese communist victory in 1949, this remained the case until Tamsui, the only remaining consular post on the island, was closed in 1972 following the establishment of full diplomatic relations between Britain and the People's Republic of China in that year. The consular set up on the island, which dated from 1861, was complicated. By 1895, there were effectively two establishments. The principal one was in the south at what until 1887 was confusingly named Taiwan Fu, with a branch office nearby at Anping. In the north was Tamsui itself, some way north of Taipei, which would eventually become the capital of the island. And here are some footnotes. Um, if you want to read those, I recommend that you pause the video. Oh no, it stops here. So I better continue with the hardcover. Uh, right, uh, let's go back to, let's stop the share. And go back to the hardcover. So here we are, just a moment, please. It is perhaps not surprising that these letters while providing Sato with background to the more formal communications that would form the official record, are even more given over to the difficulties of living than usual. While perhaps Hakodate was still somewhat primitive in Western terms, the other major Japanese treaty ports, Yokohama, Kobe, and Nagasaki were, by 1895, comfortable places to live. Taiwan was not. In the last years of Chinese rule, Taiwan had begun to undergo major changes, but it was still backward compared to Japan. Roads were bad. The railway system was of very recent origin and already much dilapidated in 1895. Shipping and with it mail was haphazard and very expensive. Bad weather led to the loss of ships and with it mail. Sanitation throughout most of the island was primitive at best. Healthcare was generally very limited. Foreign doctors, mostly missionaries, were generally up country and rarely accessible. Small foreign community mostly relied on self-medication. At least one foreign doctor who had looked after consular staff was dropped by them and the rest of the foreign community. In September 1896, he was reported to be utterly unemployed and mostly drunk, in quotation marks. Efforts were underway to get him back to the mainland and to try to recruit a replacement. The climate was subtropical to tropical with very high humidity. In the southern part of the island, fever, perhaps malarial, was a constant worry. In July 1899, Layard at Tainanfu reported that his wife is now or was very bad with fever for three days and is not yet out of the woods. While their daughter Christabel, Sato's goddaughter, was a sight not to be seen with prickly heat and boils. Outbreaks of plague occurred regularly, sometimes with a high death rate. Foreigners seem to have been able to avoid it, but it was a constant worry. Uh, there is a footnote refer referring to a contemporary account of the island, which can be found in James W. Davidson, The Island of Formosa, Historical View from 1430 to 1900, etc. Yokohama, Japan, Kelly and Walsh, 1903. To make matters worse, for much of the period covered by these letters, Taiwan was in a state of turmoil as a result of opposition to the Japanese takeover. While often rebellion was difficult to distinguish, from what seemed to be endemic banditry, the net results were the same. 
Disturbances were still being recorded five years after the Japanese takeover. In the view of the consular staff, the situation was made worse by the quality of the Japanese who came to Taiwan, whether as officials, soldiers, or merchants. Joseph Longford, writing in June 1896, claimed that the Japanese police were almost worse than the brigands, that's in quotation marks. He forwarded a letter from a Presbyterian missionary of the quotation marks, wanton destruction of Chinese graves to build a police barracks with coffins torn in two and human bones scattered about the place. He also reported that the Japanese prime minister, Ito Hirobumi, had visited the island to see for himself what conditions were like. Longford, who had, not long, who had long known him, that's Ito, had been asked to brief him and claimed to have spared no details. His successors reported that the heavy-handed behavior continued with Chinese beaten up or even killed for failing to show respect to Japanese. Similar reports would come after the Japanese established a protectorate in Korea in 1905 and later, when Korea was taken over as a colony in 1910. And if an officer wanted to retreat to his home, there seems to have been little comfort there. All those sent to Taiwan from Japan complained about the housing. All buildings suffered from damp and were poorly maintained. The Office of Works approach, uh, responsible for the buildings, uh, based in Shanghai, the Office of Works, seems to have been to patch things up and hope for the best. Henry Bonar and his wife were showered with debris when their ceiling fell in. A colleague found the main beam in the sitting room had collapsed, also bringing down much debris. Complaints about co accommodation were, of course, not unknown in Japan, but there it was possible to find alternative premises, something not available in Taiwan. This was especially the case since at both Tainan Fu and Tam Sui, the main consular offices and accommodation were not in areas occupied by other foreigners. At the former, the merchants only came in the winter. At other times of year, they based themselves at Anping, several miles to the north of the city, once a thriving port and still important for shipping produce to China. There was a consular office to which Longford wanted to move, but without success. Um, Tam Sui was another port city. Longford later wanted to shift the whole operation there to be nearer the central government and to benefit from a more salubrious site. But Tam Sui also had the disadvantage of being a long way from Taipei, where the government and other consuls resided. Although Longford's successor, Henry Bonar, was not so keen on Tam Sui, that eventually became the main consular offices and residence. In between moaning about the poor conditions, staff carried out their normal business. By and large, they were not impressed with the quality of the British on Taiwan. Bonar noted in 1898 that the Germans were better at trade for the Britons would not get out of old grooves, that's in quotation marks, but he and his colleagues did their best for them, trying to sort out the problems created by the change from Chinese to Japanese control. The merchants had got used to one system and did not like the new ways. There were problems over leases, sometimes because these were in the names, name of Chinese employees rather than the British merchant. Similarly, much of the camphor trade was fronted by Chinese. And as the date for the new Japanese treaties extending extraterritoriality loomed closer, worries about what the future would hold for foreigners began to increase. So that was uh, July 1899, July 17th, 1899. The uh, new uh, treaties ending extraterritoriality came into effect. A rumor spread that the Japanese had purchased several thousand sets of foreign style prisoners clothes, leading to fears that all foreigners would end up in jail. As with similar fears in Japan proper, the reality turned out to be less worrying. Clearly, Taiwan was a difficult place for many. The isolation and the difficulties of working were manifold. Trade returns were a nightmare as the Japanese customs authorities seemed unable or unwilling to provide information. Limited leave did not help. There were few places to go in Taiwan and conditions in nearby China could be just as bad. Mrs. Layard and Christabel, having recovered from fever and boils, went to the hills above Fuzhou, Fuzhou only to be made homeless in a typhoon. Uh, Joseph Longford was particularly despondent. Sato noted on a letter from Dr. Wickham Myers, not the alcoholic, who wrote privately to say that Longford needed to get away that part of the problem was that Longford decided to go to Taiwan without his wife and children, the first time he had been separated from them. 
Yet clearly, even those who had their wives with them, and in Layard's case, his daughter as well, found conditions trying. Younger people could cope better, whereas Longford, as he himself said, was disappointed that his efforts over many years had scarcely been recognized. Sato did not comment. But to end on a positive note, though occasionally sad, this, the final volume of Sato's private correspondence from Japan, makes for most entertaining reading. J. E. Hoa, September 2020. That's the end of the uh, forward. Well, they're a bit heavy, but I want to show you, these are the five volumes of hardcover um, for Sato's uh, correspondence when he was British minister in Japan, letters written to him, not by him. Um, as I think I mentioned already, the hardcover, there are two volumes of volume one, one A and one B, because uh, constraints of the publishing process mean that Amazon could not um, uh, give me more than 550 pages for one volume. Uh, in the case of the uh, paperback, and I have one here, um, this is the only one of the paperbacks I have, uh, this is more than 550 pages. So that means the paperback series has only four volumes, whereas the hardcover has actually got five volumes, but uh, the first two are 1A and 1B. Okay, so that I hope explains that. Um, as for where you might be able to get your hands on these volumes, um, if you're in Japan, um, I have donated paperback the paperback series to the Yokohama Archives of History. So I presume it's available in the reading room there. And um, the hardcover is available in the library of Kyushu Institute of Technology, uh, QTEC, where I have been teaching. And then if you are, happen to be in Britain, um, there are two places where, where you should be able to um, read the uh, books, and that is the Cambridge University Library, where I have donated a set of hardcover, the hardcover series, and the same, I've donated a hardcover series to Gonville and Keys College Library, um, which is, was my, is my college at Cambridge. Well, I think that's about it. I don't know that I have much more to say on this topic, uh, except that um, I do hope that people will take a look at these books. And if they're hard to come by, there's always the Kindle, which is not perhaps uh, everybody's cup of tea, but uh, it has the merit of being much, much lighter than these monsters and um, cheaper as well. Okay, good. Well, thank you very much. And um, I will see you with another video, no doubt, in due course. Uh, goodbye for now.